any questions for Thomas? I suppose I have um, one question. Um, with, with regard to a lot of this, it, it um, relates to kind of the uh, kind of conventions inherent within orchestration, and that obviously, if you've got players, they play the red tree that they used to. Mm -hmm. And so, are there conceivably situations where something could work, but might be impaired by players' conception of what is possible? So, like they tend to preempt the fact that it won't work, um, or they feel uncomfortable because it's not something within their normal comfort zone. I, I, I think that um, I don't know if, if what I said addresses that, but I will say that I address that when I score read. So um, somebody will, like, I, I have a website where I, um, I you know, just offer to look at people's scores and give them an opinion when I've got time. And a lot of time I'll see something that is a beautiful idea if only people could play it. Or I'll see a, um, something that would be a beautiful idea if there were 20 hours of practice time. Um, so I do have to say that. But I mean, that also registers with, you know, I can hear what they mean, or I can even just see what they mean, but it just doesn't, you know, my radar will just go up and, and I'll just say this is, this is an impractical idea. It doesn't mean that it's a wrong idea, but, it, you know, in practice, nobody has that much money unless the person is, you know, Elliot Carter or something like that, or John Adams. <coughs> Well, one of the issues composers have with writing for orchestra, if they haven't done it much before, is you know it's it's wonderful to write it on some alias or whatever program. It sounds great there, but then you know you don't really have a clear idea of what the acoustics can sound like. To, right. You know, there. In terms of balance, I think um, yeah, it's quite perceptible, isn't it? So, yeah. It's something you look for in your own way. Yeah. Well, I. I'm, the thing is, I mean, I just really look at Sibelius as a tool, full stop. And I'm, I'm always encouraging people to not listen to the, you know, to, to not go overboard on buying sounds, but to instead spend the, you know, use the resources of their life instead of spending, you know, going to a job and using the time spent at the job or, or shaking down their parents for the money to go out and buy a set of really, really cool sound sets. Instead, I'm saying, you know, look, just spend the time, spend the hours on training your ears, spend this time on score reading, spend the time on mental hearing, just putting the, turning off the recording and, and letting the notes speak to you. Um, things like that are just so much more powerful because the orchestra that's in your side, that's inside your head is just, you know, if once you've heard enough, once you know what people are really capable of and what it really sounds like, it's so much more powerful than any sound set. So, so that's, that, that when applied, that thinking when applied to Sibelius, and that knowledge ends up with a powerful score, or if you've got, if you also have good musical ideas too. But uh, but yeah, um, but I do I do see a lot of defects in um, in student scoring just arriving um, from the from the actual way that the that the that the notation software works. Are there any particular notable works um, that we might be familiar with that you would like to fix? <laughs> oh, don't get me started. <laughs> well, um, the thing about it is that I feel that if I were to fix them, that I would violate them in a way. You know, especially if it's if it's something that is in the repertoire. There's a certain understanding of its imperfections as being part of its sound. I mean, I can recognize them as being imperfect, but I mean, I, I sort of know how to fix them, but I don't really want to because that was the that was the other composer's job. It's it's you know. It's all done. But then, then again, there's a situation. Um, I did an education concert earlier this year, and it was for a chamber orchestra size a version of Orchestra Wellington, and it was for smaller stages. And um, we had a situation where the mascot would come on stage, who was a big chicken. And we, for the music for that, we were using um, the dance of the chicks in their shells. Now, there's no possible way that the Ravel orchestration would work over the, the chatter of the kids, you know, freaking out and saying, there he is, there he is. So I, that's a case where I reorchestrated it to make it sound full. And I felt that in that context, it was, a, it was an unsubtle 
version <laughs> of, Rims of uh, sorry, of, of Mussorgsky. Um, and it didn't really bear a strong resemblance to the other orchestrators who had tackled it. Um, but it, it wasn't too crude. I, I mean, I felt that there was, the way that the musicians were was playing was sensitive. So within that context, it, it was a success. But, you know, but that's, that's something that probably, if I was writing a serious concert thing, I, I might not even touch it at all because it's, it sort of has been done. There are other things I'd rather orchestrate. That's good. Um, just um, going back to sound samples, um, given the huge amount of um, synthetic orchestras that are used in film score and, and things like that, do you think there's a danger that a lot of people new to orchestration actually have that as their sound world, which is quite different from a real orchestra? I, I'd say there's more than a danger. I think that's, that's a reality. Yeah. It's a reality. Um, somebody was asking me about it earlier today. Um, about 70 or 80 percent of the people that I run into on YouTube and Facebook and so on and so forth they come from the idea that Hans Zimmer is, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Goldsmith and, and John Williams and so on, that is, their, you know, that is their understanding. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are closed-minded, but it's just where they are at. And they can get those sounds really easily with sound sets. So they feel like they're, making, that they're doing something successful. And I figure my job as just a sort of an online guru is, to not, is to, not to discourage that, but to build on it. To say, oh, did you know he's getting his idea from this? But if you want to score it that way, you're going to have to increase your understanding. And then they get interested in that, which might be Bernard Herrmann. And they say, wow, that was really, really great. This is yes, but did you notice how live the strings were on the Psycho soundtrack? I mean, you just really have to be able to score incredibly well for strings. And that might hopefully pique their interest, or I might never hear from them again. Which, you know, they might decide to wash dishes for a living after that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> anyway. So you're, you're doing mostly your, your, your orchestration jobs as people sending stuff to you to then orchestrate for the movie particularly, or I mean, as a separate process from the composition process? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it really is different. I mean, I do get the occasional commission here and there, and sometimes I, I'll make a commission um, if I really feel the necessity for doing something. But right now, I'm really doing more orchestration of other works. and. And yeah, people get in touch with me, and I have some clients that I've got a long-time relationship with. Um, I'm just about to start scoring um, the orchestration for a um, for a Russian um, feature-length anime, and then I did the um, I did the arrangements for the or half about half the arrangements for the last Mission Estate concert with APM. So that's a, another example um, of the kind of work that I've been doing, and I really enjoy it. It's like a I wouldn't be doing this as like hack work or as work that I'm forced to do because poor little me, you know, I can't get enough people to commission me. I really genuinely enjoy just putting it all together, taking the responsibility to make that many people play well together and just, just doing that. I just get a big charge out of it. But you know what's interesting is, and something sort of following on from what people were saying before, I have not actually attended any of these premieres for years now. It's just like, they might be performed in some other country. In the case of the Mission to State concert, I actually had gigs that weekend that I had to attend. Um, I was the presenter. I was Farmer Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, I have to say, that was like, that is the toughest audience you'll ever get, is a bunch of kids. You know, they just, they see right through your BS immediately. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, so I, that was another, I could have gone to that one and, you know, met Billy Ocean and, and Melanie C and so on. but. I kind of wasn't really interested in that. I just wanted the job to be done, go on to the next thing, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much.